We're actually live right now, live and in living color. Uh, I just wanted to thank, uh, oh, Chad Willis. Uh, so, I just, okay. I just want to thank everybody here for joining us. Uh, for those of you on Facebook Live, um, I just want to thank you for joining us. We have Mr. Michael Campagna, oh. and we have Mr. Andy Custop, and uh, these are both of my favorite young trumpet players. And uh, guys, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join me and uh, you know do this webinar. Uh, again, yeah, it's, a, it's a big treat to have you guys in here. Uh, for those of you who don't know who these gentlemen are, Mr. Cressup is the trumpet player in Las Vegas for Boys to Men. Uh, he's also played with Aretha Franklin, and he's played with a lot of name acts that have come through the Las Vegas area. He's quickly becoming one of the top call trumpet players in the Vegas area. And to his right, uh, is Mr. Michael Campagna, who's also a North Tech, uh, North Texas grad. Uh, he's actually living in the Los Angeles area. He's playing lead with uh, Mike Barone's big band. He's playing lead uh, with a lot of the heavy cats in Los Angeles. And he's quickly becoming, again, one of the top young players out there in the LA area. And uh, guys, um, if you guys ever get a chance to hear Mike or Andy, go, go check them out. Uh, they're amazing. So with all that said, hey, guys, uh, first of all, uh, this uh, question is from Mike. Uh, Mike, can you tell us how you got involved in the horn or how you got the horn in your hand? Um, it was kind of one of those, this, those issues where I was into a lot of different things growing up. And then I was into football and baseball and uh, my mom was a musician. And so my dad was like, well, he's going to play sports. My mom's like, he's going to do something creative with his time because he's not just going to be one of those kids. And, uh, after a while, I wound up getting a couple of different injuries. Like I was like, it's just not worth playing sports anymore. So I just dove into music. Um, I'm a very competitive type of person. So music was one of those things where it's like I could compete against myself to constantly try and get better. Mm -hmm. Um, so started in fourth grade and pretty much have been playing ever since. So, Mike, you're from New York, or Long Island, am I correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, you know, you got up. What kind of player were you? Were you would you call yourself more of a natural player where it just came easy, or did you really have to work at it? Um, it, it definitely came easy at the beginning, just like the basic fundamentals of it. Um, but it also helped. My mom, she played um, all of the brass instruments, all the, the high brass instruments, so every time I go home and I practice, she'd practice with me. So it, I think it helped kind of pile up the knowledge, you know, um, I've never early on, I didn't have to, I don't feel like I had to work like super hard because it was, it was like a video game. You just, you get better and you're like, Oh, cool. I just want to keep playing, you know, yeah. and it's getting the horn to your face. Right. And so Andy, how did the horn get in your hand? Um, my uh, my grandma played trumpet when she was younger. My my dad still plays, so was, my dad got me into it um, when I was really young. Um, you know, probably third third grade ish, yeah. something like that. But um, yeah, and I just it's it's always been something that I've I've really really enjoyed, and um, like the the. The physical part of playing the, the horn came pretty easy to me um, right away. It's just been, you know, the, the technical, the, all that fun stuff that you, it's all the hard part that, it, it, you know, to learn <laughs> all, the hard stuff is all hard. the hard stuff, man. Like that's, that's what I've struggled with. Um, I had to work on the most. So, so both, both of you are our first chair players and you guys are equally comfortable playing any chair, but in high school, were most of you, were you guys mostly first chair players or were you guys mostly section players? What were your strengths? What were your weaknesses? Michael, I'll let you start. Um, well, you know, uh, high school, in high school, I was in Texas. I moved to Texas when I was 10, 11 years old. So it was a, it was a different breed of schooling because they definitely wanted you to excel and and it was a it was, it was really fun to play there because you had a lot of competition between the schools um but when i went to high school i would say i mean i played mostly lead because i i had a c on top of the staff i was the only trumpet player in the high school that had a c and i was like 
I'm, I can play high notes. <laughs> little did I know, little did I know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> and uh, so, Andy, as far as you in high school, like what was, like, again, were you more of a first chair player? Like, or were you, like, what was your thing? Like, and what did you struggle with? Um, mostly, yeah, I was playing first for most of the stuff. It was a, a smaller school, so we didn't have a, a real big program. Mm -hmm. Uh, smaller city anyway um but um yeah like I've, I've it took me forever to learn how to sight read at all you know so i'm still learning Don't yeah that's it's, yeah it's, it's it's still a struggle for yeah. sure but i mean it was it was real bad i was a senior in high school and i could barely read music i mean i could read the music but it was it took me a while to figure that out um so Andy, were you again? You and I have I just listened to you. I mean, like when I was in high school, I just had chops. I had I had a G when I was in high school and A's yeah. and whatever. So yeah. was it the same for you? Like you just had chops. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And I like I, I struggled with reading. You know. Um, so okay, so you guys are you're in high school now. When was it? Was it in high school? Or was it later? And I'll start with Mike. When you said this is what I want to do, and this is I'm going to go pursue this, was it in high school? Or was it after? There was a, it was in high school. There was a moment, you know, a, I wasn't being challenged a lot in high school, right? So I was the the band program. It was just like, it was kind of like he was saying, small town. The competition came from outside of the school. Yeah, and so the the teacher was playing to the band's strengths as a whole. And wasn't necessarily giving me the most difficult parts or wasn't trying to challenge me in different ways right right and so i lost interest real hard right around my junior year sophomore year kind of right when you're like i don't need to do this this isn't cool <laughs> you know right. um luckily though uh, i have to say I, I had one the assistant band director at the time uh john morgan he he pulled me in, in his office one day and he, and he was like, Hey man, what's going on? And because my dad basically talked to him and said that I was thinking about quitting. And, uh, he just pulled me in the office one day and we sat down we talked for a good 30 minutes after school one day. And he was just like, yo, what's going on? I explained the situation and he's like, all right, we're going to do, he, he went against the rules of the school and taught me lessons. Right. And so every whatever it was once a week, twice a week, we, I'd come in after school and we just play in the band hall. He made music more fun because we were just listening to records and we'd play and we'd do this. And it was kind of a little bit of everything. We'd play jazz and play classical. And then from that point, it really ignited like the passion to play music. Right. And I honestly didn't even know about North Texas until this guy, you know, my, my high school band director was like, have you ever, Thought about where you want to go to college. Yeah. I want to go to Juilliard. He's like, okay, cool. <laughs> North Texas. <laughs> um, so it was, uh, it was definitely a, a thing where it happened probably around my senior year when I really started to like become passionate about music. And that was when I made that decision. Sorry, I was trying to plug in my, my laptop. I apologize. I'm so, I'm <laughs> like, so what is angry. he doing? <laughs> I'm so angry right now. I can't <laughs> so, yeah. So, Andy, was it in high school for you? I mean, was it the point? Where, what was that where you're like, this is what I want to do and this is I want to Was it during high school or after? It was definitely um, pretty early on in high school when I realized that's what I wanted to do. Um, in, in middle school, like probably sixth grade, I started taking private lessons with uh, the guy that my dad studied with when he was a kid. Yeah. And it was, um, you know, he was, he was a, he was a hard ass, but he, uh, so he pushed me a lot. Um, but it was, you know, probably about, yes, freshman year of high school when I, when I realized my professional golf career probably wasn't going to work out. <laughs> <laughs> So I realized that one early. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> that was definitely a good choice to not keep pursuing that. But yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I, I just seemed like the most logical thing to go into because it was the, really the only other thing I was passionate about was music. So I knew I wanted to do something with music. So let me ask you guys, and I'm going to 
I'm gonna I'm gonna press pause here, but there's um there's a there's a saying that you know if you can do anything else, then do that. But if you're hopelessly diseased with music, then that's your calling, you know. Uh, <laughs> and that's just that's that's what happened to me, and I'm sure that's what happened to you guys. Did you guys feel like look at I this is this is what this is what I this is what I excel at, this is what I'm good at. And I mean, or was there ever, you know what? I could be also a really good fireman. I mean, was there any doubt uh, that you're like, no, I'm doing music? Does the, does the, can we include the last nine months? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought about doing a lot of different yeah. shit the last, <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I mean, there's always the thought of what if, you yeah. know, you're always thinking about things that you could have done. You know, no. I wanted to do baseball. I, I thought I had a career in baseball. I was good at it growing up, you know, but then I realized why <laughs> it was it, the, my injuries were causing too much pain right. and too much time off from doing other stuff. So I was like, well, go to an hour practice and then ice my knees down for, you know, four hours just to try and get the swelling to come down. It wasn't really worth it. Right. Um, but I mean, once, I, honestly, I think when it really, when you get bit by the bug is after that first concert with a really, really good band or first like rehearsal with a really good band and you, everything is just clicking. And it, it really yeah. kind of happened in college for me. It was like you yeah. play with a, at North Texas, even the lowest band is pretty darn good, or at least it was when we were, yeah. I haven't been around, so I, I couldn't speak for current. I'm assuming that it is <laughs> yeah. equally as good, but, uh, no, you get to play with some amazing players and you realize, oh, shit, this is it, man. Yeah, this yeah. is what I want to do because you just yeah. have that bug that bites you, you know. Andy, was it the same way for you? I mean, did you ever say, well, you know what? I'm actually a really good dancer. I mean, or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, what was the... I never said that. You know what? Austin, Austin tells me you're a good dancer. He's like, oh, yeah, but he can dance. Uh, so, because I had to. <laughs> the best of them. Yeah. So, uh, no, but I mean, was it the same way for you too? Was it like, uh, were you like, did did you ever question? Uh, did you ever like, well, I'm really good at this, but I can also do this, or was it like tunnel vision, where like that's the focus? It was uh, mostly just focused on on trying to become a you know a professional player. Yeah. Um, I mean, I always kind of, if that wasn't an option, I always kind of wanted to, you know, I started working at a golf course when I was 13 years old. So I, I worked there until I've moved to Texas really. So, yeah. um, so I've always had a passion for that too, but it's, I don't, I don't really want to do that for a career, you know, I, yeah. especially when I could be playing music with, you know, guys like this and like yourself and, yeah. and it's, it's just, it's been it's been a great what six seven years now since i've finished school you know and you know you could always go back to being a ball washer man yeah man <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Not yeah. Just... <laughs> never too old for that you know <laughs> that's true mike you've got a good point i might have to actually you know, do that here you go yeah. yeah if that works out for you let me know guys i, I get in that too so yeah. um, the same so also so here's the thing so high school ends it's time to go to college. Both of you picked North Texas. Um, I know that Andy went there for grad school, but Mike, you went there as an undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about Mike. Let's talk about the decision to go to North Texas. You know, I think you touched on that a little bit, but tell me about your first week. Tell me about what it was like to study with the great Jay Saunders, mm -hmm. you know, and then, uh, and then we'll go from there. But I mean, tell me what your first like. What were some of the eye openers when you've walked on that campus? Uh, man, there's. Do we have enough time to talk just about? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, that's a, there's a lot there that we're working with. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, as best as you can, man. Go ahead. I mean, my first week on on campus, man. I, I came out of high school kind of like everybody does you know when you're first chair in high school and you've been first chair in high school and you i made first chair all region jazz and oh i was second alternate state mm. <laughs> you think you're hot shit let's yeah. just yeah, everyone you know and there's a bunch of 
kids that come in as freshmen, like underclassmen that come in as freshmen and go, I'm hot shit. And then they take the audition and don't make a band or take the audition and get stuck in the nine o'clock. And you're like, oh, I am shit. <laughs> cool. and, it, and it comes, it's that, that immediate like, boom. You're no longer the big fish in the small pond. Right. You've moved into, this is real, you know? So, I mean, my first week on campus was awesome because it was exciting because I was like, cool, I'm gonna get better. I've always worked better in a, in a pressure cooker setting. Right. And that's exactly what North Texas is. Um, no. So that plus, I mean, there's a lot of distractions on a college campus. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. Just a few, especially in Texas. There's lots of... In the summertime. In the summertime. Yeah, yeah. No, I get it. I get it. I get hey, it. Yeah. Sorry, I was distracted. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I mean, it was, it was really awesome because I'd been on that campus a couple times before. I did a couple of the camps. Yeah um previously just to kind of feel out the the school as a whole because you know jay yeah. was there mike Stel mike steinell was there and, and oh wow uh, yeah mike Steinel. other cats were running this this thing and so it really kind of gave me an idea of what i was getting into right and kind of what i was gonna who i was gonna get taught by and who i was gonna learn my future from you know yeah. it, it was definitely an exciting time um i mean I remember my first, my first class was, was Jay Monday morning at 8 AM. It was, it was uh, records, jazz records class with Jay Saunders. And now if anybody doesn't know who Jay Saunders is, he, he is basically the, he's like everybody's favorite uncle, you know, like he's that one uncle that you, that you respect tremendously. And if he just gets a little disappointed in you, you're crushed. And so, like, I remember my first class, we walk in and he's playing, um, I can't remember the exact record, it's, it's that, like, nine-minute Paul Gonzalez solo on um, uh, one of the festivals Duke Ellington was playing at. Anyway, I think it was, like, Montreux yeah. Jazz Festival or something, something like that. I can't remember the record. He's going to watch this and be like, fail! <laughs> but I, I remember, you know, he's, he's halfway through yeah. the solo and all of a sudden Jay turns the volume down and goes, I mean Jesus, and then turns it back up. <laughs> yeah. A couple minutes later, ain't that the damnedest thing you've ever heard? <laughs> and then turns, and it's just like you realize that this guy has this larger than life personality. But then you, when you get to know him more and more, you realize this dude has lived what I want to live. I mean, he right. toured with Kenton for a handful of years, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. You know, and he just he just been playing with everybody. He moved to Dallas and did the, all the jingles for the jingles. He did some of the jingles for ESPN for a while. And, like, it was one of these things where he had a full career. And you're like, okay, I'm learning from somebody who's who's hip. I mean, he, yeah. he knows what it's about. He knows how to work in the scene. So, like, Jay was um, – he was never apologetic in how he spoke to you. Yeah. He would never be rude. He'd never be crass, but he would always shoot extremely straight from the hip. Very dry, very, you know, I mean, I was not the best student. Yeah, and, me neither. Yeah. <laughs> so there were a couple of these exercise sheets that I would just fail miserably on. And, and he would be like, we get two or three in and you go, all right. So have you actually practiced these? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ex <laughs> Exhibit A. <laughs> Got him right here. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. of us. Have it. I got yeah. one at the house. You know, yeah. they're good exercises to to play. Yeah. They just work you through the whole register of the horn. But there would be some days where he would just be like, "Okay, you obviously haven't practiced. We need to talk. What's going on in your life?" And we'd sit down and we just talk. Right. And he'd figure out what's going on, what the distraction is, whether it was school or personal, and then we would figure it out. And then next week, I'd come back even stronger. Right. You know, and it was he was more of a, a mentor than just a teacher. Yeah. Um, but I mean, his whole concept. I mean, I don't know how deep you want me to go into into Jay. So we could talk about Jay. I took from Jay for six years, so I have a lot of experience with Jay. <laughs> well, um, no. So Andy, on your end, you came in as an as a grad student. Yeah. You, you have already went through the program. You've already went through a program. You got your degree. You learned the pedagogy. 
tell us about your first week at North Texas. What were the eye openers? What was the, wait a minute, what, what, you know, I mean, a lot of, a lot of young people think that when you walk in, it's just like a regular campus. No, there are 250 trumpet majors. Right. Right. Oh, and yeah. I mean, the, the enormity, the, 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 the grandeur of this, I don't think a, a lot of people grasp. So yeah. yeah, Andy, what was your first week like? Tell me what that was, was like. It was a lot like uh, what Mike was talking about. You know, I, I showed up and like my undergrad school was not a big program at all. So, you know, I was playing first and lead and everything there. So I still, you know, I had a little bit of that high school attitude going into the place and, and yeah, it was a reality check to say the least, you know, but you know, cause I'm going in and I got, I don't know, 45 other undergrad players that could just play my ass under the table, you know? And uh, so, yeah, that when I first checked the, uh, the audition results and was in the eight o'clock lab band board of doom. Yeah. The board of doom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the board of doom. <laughs> yeah. But that's a, yeah. that was a big reality check, but I mean, it was, it was nice to be in a community of uh, that many students that, yeah. that wanted to help each other get better. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it was a competitive environment, but it wasn't, wasn't ever like, there wasn't ever anybody that was like, Hey man, I don't like playing with this guy and I'm not going to help him and screw you. You know, yeah. it yeah. was, it was a really, really, uh, we had a, a lot of really good, a lot of really good friends there. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely like a fraternity. Yeah, you know, yeah. When, with the groups that you really went to school with, you you just like Andy. I haven't seen Andy in five years. Yeah, at least. I mean, yeah. So it's one of those situations where it's like I haven't seen him, but showed up, ah, hugs. You know, yeah. thing you know, where it's just like we're sitting here drinking water, talking to your ass. You know, and <laughs> you know, it's like never missed a beat. Yeah. yeah. And so, like Andy, one of the things that is. I think very, very impressive about your, your background is that a lot of people don't know this about you, but you made the one o'clock band as a classical major. That's almost unheard of. That's like, you know, that's like, dude, it's like you came out of nowhere, you know, it's like, so tell us, I mean, and I think that's why you're so good at what you do. I mean, because it doesn't matter what you play, you're, it doesn't matter whether it's well, it doesn't matter what style it's like you were mattered because i don't hear that a lot that one classical major crossed over to be lead trumpet in the one o'clock band tell us how that happened and tell us about you know was it a different mindset for you or like well i mean tell us about that yeah i uh i never made it to the lead spot in the one o'clock i was playing the second chair um, ah so you split split lead yeah it was split a little split lead yeah split lead um, but, uh, <laughs> let's see. So I, yeah, I came into North Texas as a classical major and, uh, the, just the more I was around the, the, you know, playing in the lab bands and around all the other, the jazz guys and everything, it's like, man, these guys are having way more fun. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, not sitting in an orchestra counting forever and like, <laughs> you know, you got to be so damn good to have a classical job, you know, yeah. and it's, there was, you know, a ton of classical players there too, that were just phenomenal. Yeah, DNA that, students are crazy. Yeah. The, yeah. The doctoral students there were just unreal, you know, yeah. they're all, yeah. they're all got teaching jobs or playing jobs now, but yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it was, I just kind of, you know, after after about a year and a half or so still doing the classical stuff and then and then i started studying with jay a little bit no yeah. um my second year there and just kind of yeah by by that by my last year there i had just kind of completely switched over i was still taking my my classes towards my classical degree but i wasn't studying classical trumpet anymore yeah so so let's let's talk about i mean it's weird not weird, but it's refreshing to know that North Texas isn't like, because I've heard horror stories about Berkeley. I mean, I went to the, the new school, Manhattan New School, and you got vibe the moment you walked through the door. Like, they're like, who's this Joker from Phoenix? Or, you know, who's this, you know, the fact that you guys said that, you know, everybody helped everybody else. Nobody, you guys didn't have to put up with nobody vibing you. You know, I think that's another thing, too. 
Uh oh, hold on, hold on. We still vibed each <laughs> yeah, other. Saying, but... We never said there wasn't a vibe going. Like, <laughs> we just said that we, we'd help each other, but it'd be like, did you really want to cut that off on one? Yeah. <laughs> Where are we going to cut that off? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> It was it was a, a vibe where I think a lot of the horror stories that I've heard from North Texas were from mostly the, the people and this is a general story, yeah. obviously where there were a lot of people who didn't pick up on the vibe that like it's a friendly like yeah jab we're not trying to actually talk shit we're just jabbing at you like yeah you, did you really want to do that yeah okay okay cool 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 let me so get my pencil let me where's that. my pencil? <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. Let me four and a half. Okay. <laughs> you know. Yeah. It, I mean, yeah. Go ahead. No, it's it's that's what it is. I think a lot of it. I mean, there is a very friendly. The the core of everything over there has yeah. got this very family like setting. Yeah. But with any family, when you're around the same people day in day out, I mean. Every, at, at North Texas, the undergrad is 145 credit hours. Wow. And 75% of them are, I think 75 hours of them are single credit hours. Wow. Yeah. And so you're with the same 18 fuckers every day. <laughs> every day. And so eventually, you know, you butt heads with something, you know, yeah. opinions or whatever. But it was never a situation where it was like there was love lost from it, you know? Okay. You know? Yeah, because I, I mean, for some of the college kids watching or some of the young people watching that are at North Texas or a school like that, you know, they, you know, we, they get put up with, or they get the whole, I get this a lot, you know, the vibe question. And, you know, it's for you guys being in an environment like North Texas, which is very competitive. And then you guys go into environments like Las Vegas and Los Angeles, which is, Super competitive, with competitive, and you get vibed. That's the end, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and so, so let's 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 talk about uh, Mike. When I uh, one of the things I I want to talk to you about is uh, when I first heard you, I heard you do a tribute to Maynard thing, mm -hmm. and I was sitting about six feet away from you, and you did MacArthur Park, and you you nailed the thing like like you've been playing it for years, which is amazing, but. You didn't part my hair. You just played the tune. You know what I mean? And that's what, one thing I thought. I'm like, that guy, that guy's a, he knows what he's doing. You know what I mean? It's, it wasn't, you You just weren't another lead player blowing your brains out. Yeah. You, know, you just played the thing and that was it. And, you know, you were more like, like your double A's were in tune. Everything was very precise. And then when I talked to you later on, we got to hang out. You were, t you talked about tradition at North Texas. How is very there's a big tradition vibe there, mm -hmm. and can you talk about that? Or like, and then Andy too. I wanted your take on that. But Mike, what what did can you explain that tradition vibe? I mean, this is something that Jay had drilled into me because I came in once I did find the range. I was that like, yeah, I'm gonna put a kiss off. I'm gonna take this. Oh, we're playing cute. Let me take the last note up an octave. You know. Oh, we're playing this bassy tune. <laughs> yeah i'm a you know and then you get the you get the look from the back wall going <laughs> i hate that look you know when you walk over you feeling good and all of a sudden jay just looks at you like well that was a choice yeah you know, like, but it was, was it was a, a thing where like if you started in the lower bands when i got to school the nine o'clock, eight o'clock, seven o'clock, we were meant to work on the basics, the fundamental of big band, right? Yeah. Because that's what North, North Texas is really about big band music. It's slow. Yeah. It's actually changing now and, and turning into its new thing, its own thing a little bit. Right. Still big band based. All right. But I remember my first semester, I played Duke Ellington, I played Thad Jones, and I played freaking Basie. That was it. Played Cottontail, played, you know, Basie straight ahead, all of the, the standards of big band. And we're not a meeting. Sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but he, it, it was like we were forced to learn to do it right. Yeah. And, you know, um, the directors took that seriously and they would yeah. sub out and they'd bring in somebody like uh, Dave Richards. Yeah. Would come in and 
I remember Dave ripped me hard one day and Dave's a good friend of mine. Yeah. He, he's one of my buddies and he would, he would sit there and he cut us off. We're playing a bassy tune and he goes, all right, so who's listened to this tune? You know, we're 18 bars in, you know, he's like, who's listened to this? Four people raise their hand. I'm being smart ass. I'm eh, yeah, me a little bit. And, and he looks at me and goes, what is this? <laughs> Did you listen to it or not? Yeah. You know, and it was just like, oh, okay. So listening really that the the tradition is like understanding the original recording yeah respecting the original recording and then when you put your own twist on it don't lose the respect from the original yeah you can do your own thing with it you can make it your own but make sure that you don't disrespect the original in what you're doing right. because that process you're completely undermining your ability by doing something different right like no i don't want to say different by doing something that's not uh so doing something that's frowned upon i don't, I don't know that's the best way not to style is not I would say yeah. unappropriate unappropriate you know? yeah. yeah appropriate and so when you heard me that night the the <laughs> not to toot my own horn <laughs> uh, i had actually never played macarthur park before you could have fooled us mike well, I was like, <laughs> but the thing is, this goes back to it. I've listened to that record enough, yeah, to where it's just notes on a page. I know how it's supposed to be phrased. I know mm -hmm. how Maynard phrased it. I phrased it a little different to fit my breathing, whatever. But I phrased it similarly enough to the original, to where I could play it and make it sound good. And that's where it really came down to the tradition of North Texas and, you know, we were all about, you listen to the records, you burn those records down, you know, know what the original's like. No, yeah. that's really what it comes down to, man. And so, I mean, Andy, let's, uh, let's, let's kind of flip the coin on to your side. When I first heard you, you subbed for me on a, on a Michael Buble gig, uh, a tribute gig. And, uh, you know, first of all, not only did you read the book flawlessly, you killed the book, but, I mean, it was a three horn book, which you led, you led the horn, you led the band like you were playing lead in a big band, and you know, stylistically, didn't matter what we did, it was correct. You were very musical all the whole time, and you didn't miss, which I was like, this guy is amazing. You're like, oh, I'm only 28. I'm like, oh my god, you know, I hate you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Are we talking about him? I don't yes, know. him, him. Okay, okay, make it sure. <laughs> so sure, anyway, you know. I mean. I mean, I, I mean, but what I'm saying is, is, is that what you would call that tradition from North Texas? Was that have to do with that or what? I mean, because again, you've even said that word too about North Texas. There's tradition there. There's like, I mean, is that, is that, is that just what you've learned there? Yeah. I mean, when, when I was getting ready for that gig, I can't no. remember if you sent charts ahead of time or not, but I, I mean, I just, what I, I listened to the, to a lot of Buble recordings, you know, wow. listen to what they were doing with everything. And I figured, you know, at least that's a jumping off point and you'll tell me to do it different if you don't like it that way, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it's, but yeah, you, it's always start with that, the, you know, the original recordings of, of what they're doing. Take right. it from me, kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> always listen to the recording. Yeah. Always. Doesn't matter if you know the tune. Yeah. listen to the recordings before you get to the gig or the right. rehearsal or whatever yeah and that was something that jay was really big on too was no. you know studying when we we would study a different lead player every semester and you know we'd have transcribe. to transcribe their the you know, whatever chart we you know he had us do and and then play it as, as close as we could to the recording you know we did snooki and al persino and yeah. Dick watkins and andy hederer yep Jan mm -hmm. yep um and that's yeah jay was really big on that so it's yeah it's all about it's all about mimicking as close as you can to to the original recording yeah it really goes back to that statement know the rules so you can break the rules yeah right. well one of the things both of you have is this discipline and whether you was a, whether it was a learned trait that you guys got at north texas or whether if you already had it the thing is, is I've noticed you have discipline and you have, you have, you play what's appropriate. Both of you guys. Every time I've heard you guys, 
never anything inappropriate. I mean, I'm sure there have been times when I haven't been there, but what I'm saying is when, when <laughs> well, there's plenty of times, man. <laughs> but what I'm saying is like when it comes when it's time to pay the bills and it's time to go to work, you know, it's appropriate. I'm playing what's on the page and that's it. You know, so let's talk about okay, North Texas, you're you're doing your thing. You guys are both of you guys are there at the same time, if I if I am yeah. I correct. And yeah. so yeah. so what was the talk about, like, especially with a hang when you're like, okay, well, graduation's coming up. What now? What was the, you know, because again, we talked about how some guys go to New York City, some guys go to Vegas, some guys go to LA. Uh, we'll start with Andy. Andy, what was the choice to go to, like, what prompted you to go to Las Vegas? Well, for me, it was, uh, I was, I had just finished my fourth year of a two year master's program. So <laughs> there was, for that, <laughs> And I was looking at, I was looking at going back for a fifth year to finish up, you know, wow. finally do my classical recital and everything. And, but I had just been farting around so much, you know, doing jazz stuff that I, that didn't count towards my degree. Um, you know, so it was the, it was the summertime before that fifth year. And my, I was talking to my dad and he's like, well, what do you want to do with your life? And I'm like, well, <laughs> I want to play trumpet and Vegas or something I've always kind of wanted to do it in Vegas he said well then quit wasting money not finishing your degree and go to Vegas and just give it a shot yeah so it's a, a week later I was back in Texas packing up my shit and going out to Vegas man it was it was just kind of a last minute decision and I yeah. had a I had a couple of good friends out here uh, Jason Levi he oh yeah he yeah. helped me out big time you know yeah. Give me a place to stay for a while. And yeah, he just, yeah, Jason's a sweet that was a, he was really right. a lifesaver. Hooked me up with some reading bands and everything. And right. yeah. So, so Mike, what was the, what was the, you know, the, cause you're from New York originally, you could have went yeah. back, but what was the, the, the inclination? I got to go to LA. Well, there was a couple things. Um, there was half, like there's a business choice, right? Yeah, you want to go somewhere where you know that you're going to have the opportunity to work, right? No matter how good you are, or how bad you are, you always want to move to a place where you have the opportunity to work. So you're playing the numbers game, you're playing the probability of work, numbers of people to numbers of jobs, right? I love New York, all of my family lives there still, with the exception yeah. of my dad and my sister. Yeah. But there are there's just like a metric shit ton of people, amazing musicians, in a 15 mile radius. No. And there's three jazz clubs, there's two studios, and Broadway. But Broadway is locked up by a lot of the old school musicians that have been there. You know, and there's, no. there's ways to break in and all that, of no. course. But it's like the number of musicians that are already there that have already been working, to me, you know, to jobs, I'm just going, that didn't make sense. That wasn't a smart gamble. Right. L.A., you have heavy salsa scene you have a heavy recording scene heavy big band scene and union scene you have um i mean small group you have vocal groups you have this and that it's like there are so many different options to play you have the cover band thing which is pretty heavy out there as well as on the east coast yeah and then you look at it and go okay well which one's cheaper to live in because wow yeah, yeah oh new york is more expensive than la yeah yeah, well, I think that's a good. I think that the fact that you weighed out the economics of it. I mean, Andy's just like, you know what? I'm going out to Vegas, and whatever happens, happens. But you know, there's also that too, where you weighed out the economics of it. I think that's very smart. A lot of young musicians who just, you know, they don't think of the economics, and I, the, I think the fact that you did, you know, kind of weigh those things out. Um, so let's talk about Mike. You you moved out to Los. We'll start with you. You moved out to L.A. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I mean, like you, I've worked L.A. and New York. And for me, New York was easier to break into than L.A. Um, for uh, that's just my you know. Um, so and they're different. They're different. Totally yeah. different uh, scenes. But let's talk about. Of course, I've heard a lot of your uh, your uh, fellow alumni say, "Don't wave." the North Texas flag in places like Las Vegas or New York city or LA. No, no. That's no. the first thing you don't want to do. So the, the, the reason that is, yeah. is when you're in college and you're in a school like North Texas, for example, all you're thinking about is 
making the one o'clock, right? That's your focus because that's the that's the goal at hand, right? Right. You don't think about your future because you're like, well, I'm going to be here for four years. I might as well just try to make the best of it now. Yeah. Right. So when you make the one o'clock, now you're like, I've made the one o'clock. Yeah. I saw you do that once, Gwen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you nailed it, man. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you you get there and you're like cool now granted i never made it there but when i was working in dallas because there was a few years between my my degree and moving here yeah i'm i realized that like all the gigs i'm getting called for out here i'm playing with all one o'clock guys i made the three o'clock at my as my highest but i'm playing with all the one o'clock guys yeah. i'm getting called over certain other you know people who've been there who's available and i'm going why is this It's because at the end of the day it doesn't matter what band you made in college it matters how good of a player you are how good of a hang you are and whether or not you're going to show up on time and do your job efficiently no and not absolutely. cause problems absolutely so with a lot of young young people like all you young people out there here's a psa for you the number one rule for moving to a new place is don't be a dick and I know that sounds like common sense, but just be a good person, be a nice person to be around. Because if new cats want to be around you, that you're going to be on their mind, they're going to want to call you. Even if you're not necessarily on top of your game, you'll get called for rehearsals and then you'll get better. Mm -hmm. And then once you get better, you're still going to be on their mind for gigs. Right. So it's, you're playing the long, slow game. Right. It's business at that point, you know? Right. And then uh, and then we'll go on to Andy, but just, uh, Mike, um, there's a saying that you have to give L.A. five years. Now, in your, in your case, you broke in really rather quickly, and I think it's because you had that business acumen going in. And, and then from meeting you, even from that first night, I mean, we hung out together. And we've been friends ever since. But the thing is, is that, I mean, it's like I've, it, it, after meeting you, I was like, I was like, every time I thought of lead trumpet player, I thought, well, Mike, you know, and it's weird how that happens. You know, you think about, he's such a great guy. He's a great, we had a great time. I, I, um, you know, we had that session that fell through, but and I, and you yeah. were going to be my lead player, you know? Well, so, I mean, the perfect example, sorry to cut you off. No, go ahead. Keep going. But that's a perfect example of what I was saying. It's like, what was the first thing you thought about? He's a, he's a good guy. Yeah. And, you know, it's fun to be around. Oh, yeah. And also, he can play trumpet. Right. That just goes to show you. It's like, that's the proof. It's like, if you're a good person and a good hang, the playing, yeah, you got to be on top of it. You got to be a good player. But people aren't hiring you just based off of your ability anymore. Because if you're a dick, nobody wants to play with you. Right. Yeah. You know? uh, a lot of things, too, Mike, I think... Uh, you, we talked about this too. Um, it's very hard for some people to not talk about themselves and to be humble and to just be a regular guy. You know, uh, when I mentioned you were just a regular cat, but you're an amazing player. Same thing with you, Andy. You're an amazing player, but you're just like a regular guy. You know, you're just, I, you didn't talk about when we were having dinner, you didn't talk about all the bands you played in. You were talking about how good the chicken was, or something like that. You know, that was your focus, that's right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but you know, I think that's very important, guys. I mean, if you guys were to give one, one point of advice to a young trumpet player, or it doesn't matter who it is, uh, that has difficulty not talking about themselves, what would you say? How could they, kind of? I mean, what are some of the? Uh, what are some of the consequences of not being able to keep yourself in check? They're pretty dire. I mean, the consequences, I mean, cause you're, you have to kind of think of it when you move to a scene like that, you're basically playing with your, your career, your business, it's high stakes. So if you can only talk about yourself and all your accolades and this and that, you know, you move to LA, you're playing on rehearsal bands with Carl Saunders. You're playing on rehearsal bands with, I mean, any number of musicians who've just been, you know, Ron Stout and Bob Summers and all these trumpet players and sax players and trombone players that have played with everybody. They don't give 
two shits about what you've done in college. They don't because to them, they're like, you're now a, a peer with them. You're playing in a rehearsal band. Once you move to that scene, you're a peer. You're a professional. You don't have to prove yourself. You shut up. Keep your mouth shut, which is what Jay would teach. Jay had this. <laughs> Jay had this sign on his wall right in front of his desk, and it just said, "Keep your mouth shut." <laughs> yeah. And we always thought it was for us. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's to remind him when he leaves his office to keep his mouth shut. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But yeah. it was. And that's the truth though it's like if you keep your mouth shut you learn more yeah you understand how to talk with certain people you feel out the situation feel out the room more yeah. otherwise everyone thinks you're just a braggart you know braggadocious kind of cocky yeah. ass and nobody wants to be around that yeah i think it kind yeah. of devalues yourself a little yeah. bit because yeah, they're not listening to how you play anymore right they're yeah. like oh well this guy better play like he says he's good you know yeah. it's like i don't know it's it's weird it seems like you're they're trying to make their playing better by talking about it you know right yeah. it's just like, man just just play but just play better you know yeah. like, <laughs> you're right you can do the speaking yeah and uh so one thing too also guys uh and uh I'm looking at my time here, so please forgive me. I'm just trying to, you know, make uh, the best of my time here. One thing I've noticed, especially about you, Mike, when I when I first met you, I was like, man, you know, I just asked you, what are you playing? You're like, a box trad. Zeno, but it's fine. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> and then you too, Andy. <laughs> I mean, I think you were playing a strat, whatever you were playing on, whatever. And then Andy, too, when I asked you what you were playing on, you were playing on, you didn't have your uh, Del Quadro yet. No, you know? Con Vintage 1. Yeah. And you're like, that's it. You know, you didn't go into, oh, well, I have this with this modification, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's all. That's what I got. That's what I'm using. Uh, one thing, too, I noticed you guys, you know, you, you're not focused on gear. You don't blame your gear when you guys play. If you guys... You guys don't, I mean, I'm sure there are mistakes sometimes, but uh, I've never heard either one of you complain about your gear ever. You know, it's just like, it's just a tool to you guys, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, mean, uh, yeah you, can't, you can't blame the, you can't blame the horn for operator error, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, the great Rodney Booth, yeah. anybody knows who that guy is. He used to hold his horn up in class and be like, what is this? And we'd be like, it's an instrument. He's like, no, it's a piece of metal. You're the instrument. Yeah. And the definition of an instrument is something that makes a noise when you do something to it. Yeah. Right. So the only instrument that a trumpet is, is a percussion instrument, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> that's right. the only way it's making noise without modification. So yeah, real, real quickly here, real briefly here, let's talk about the obsession with gear that a lot of young people have. Uh, Mike, you know this very well. And then, two, um, you know, Andy, I noticed you went with Del Quadro, and I've talked to Mike Del Quadro. Those are great instruments, man. And Mike's a great cat. And I think, I think, you know, let's talk about the focus on gear that a lot of people obsess over, especially young people. And they spend all their money and they waste all their time when they could just be in the shed. Can you guys talk about that a little bit? We'll start with Andy. Um, I've never really been a big equipment guy. I, I had, I mean, I've probably played on, I, I played on a 3C since I started until I've got to North Texas and then I switched to a, basically a 3C equivalent of a Monet mouthpiece. Um, that's what you play? Yeah. And then, <laughs> Jesus. And then, uh, well, that's, that's just like what I practice on. And then, and then the, with the same thing with my lead mouthpiece, I just had like a, it was like a 3F or something like that, or 3E, and now I got the what, basically the Monet equivalent of that, you know. Jeez. But that's it. You yeah, know? yeah. Those are the only four mouthpieces that I've played on since I left, or, you know, since I've been playing. And it's, oh. they're, they're comfortable, and they've worked for me 80% of the time. And what, the times they didn't work, it was my fault, you know. Yeah. Again, it's just a piece of metal. It's yeah find something that's comfortable and then stop switching and screwing around with it you know yeah learn how to get comfortable with that and then if it's really still not that comfortable then maybe change yeah. but i've i've never had to switch equipment because my equipment wasn't working you know? right so, 
Mike, I was going to ask you, Mike, uh, well, <laughs> what can you, can you add to that? I mean, what can yeah. you? I mean, I think what, to piggyback up what he was saying, it's like the biggest thing that young players don't do is that when they get a new piece of equipment, because there is, I mean, you do have to figure out what you play on, yeah. right? Um, I play, like, I, I tend to, on lead pieces, I stay on V-cups because that's, that's just what works well for me. So there was a period of time where I was playing on testing out mouthpieces, but I refuse to play on a mouthpiece for like two weeks and go, oh yeah, it's great. And then, <clears throat> because what happens is three, the, the honeymoon period. Yeah. Right. That, that It goes away. Two, three right. weeks, a month down the line. Next thing you know, you're like, I can't play out of the staff. This is terrible. Right. Right. And then if you really like the way you sound on that mouthpiece, then you push and you keep on it yeah. because you have to train your body to work. Right. And so all I've, I mean, I've probably only played on six mouthpieces in my career total, yeah. you know, my classical mouthpiece is still a three C or a variation, a variant on it, you know, depending on who sells it, you know, right. certain rims feel more comfortably. Sure. Like that's really what I, I focus on. It isn't like, Oh, well, this is my Monet Q756. It's super <laughs> blah, blah. It's like, I don't care what it is as long yeah. as it feels good. And on the other end of the horn, it sounds good. Right. You know, right. I get the sound that I want. I get the, the response that I want. That's right. all I care about. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people are like, well, if I get the, if I get this with a deeper throat and then this, and then it's like, ah, stop, you're adding, you're, you're taking the equation and making it more difficult. Trump's already hard enough. Right. You're adding more variables. You're, you're, you're changing yeah. every little thing and expecting it to, you know, I don't know if you've ever bowled in your life, but like, or golf or whatever. It's like you change one thing at a time. Yeah. You work on one thing at a time to get it straight. And then when that's done, then you change the next thing to work right. on it. You don't change 17 things all at once. Right. And that's very important. I think that's a lot of young people. And for those of you who are watching this, uh, you know, uh, these guys are maybe, maybe, maybe 30. Both, I'm not going to tell you their age, but these guys are 30 and below. So they're, they're <laughs> stop, Mike. <laughs> Try, Mike, take the compliment, okay? <laughs> Hey man, I'm proud of my age. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, they're, they're very young guys. And like I said, they're not much older than you are. And so that, you know, all the problems that you're going through that we all experience as young players, these guys have found a way to overcome it. Let's talk about now guys about breaking in. When I, and we both know that term breaking in and okay. Mm -hmm. So your first day, let's talk about Andy's first day in Las Vegas. And how he's going to make his rent for that month. What went through your mind? Uh, I was scared shitless. <laughs> <laughs> was, and rightfully so. I, I, mean, I, yeah. I remember being very, very uh, anxious and, and, you know, for a while. Um, but I, uh, like I said, my buddy Jason got me introduced to a, a a guy that, that runs a reading band out here every Tuesday. And I just started playing in that band. And, and, uh, it was, you know, we do like maybe one gig a month with them, just kind of an afternoon thing. It certainly wasn't paying the bills. Like luckily my, my wife had, a, she's a teacher. So we had, had that covered at least, but it yeah. was, um, but yeah, it was really just, <clears throat> just getting into those reading bands and meeting everybody around here and just, you know, like we were saying before, just, just play and, and let everybody hear what you got, you know, you don't got to tell yeah. them your whole life story, just play and hopefully enough people like what you're doing to give you a call. And I got lucky, lucky that somebody at least, you know, a few people heard me and hired me for some things and it just kind of snowballed from there. So yeah and this is very recently you've only been in vegas what six years yeah yeah so you know i mean we're talking 2014 which is not that far uh ago yeah. mike same thing you, you you set foot in los angeles now both of you mike you know both of you are family men you know you have another person you have your response at the time you were you had another person to take care of yeah you know and both of you and that a lot of young people don't think about that because um, 
You know, it's like, it's not just me. When you're a young man, it's like, so what? I can sleep under a bridge. It's fine. It's just me. But no, it's the other person as well. You know, you got you got two people to think about. My first day in LA, you know that the first of the month is going to come and you got to pay that rent. What did you do? What went through your mind? Jesus Christ, how am I going to do this? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. It, it was like, okay, I'm here and I'm excited to be here, but also like, oh, okay, this, yeah, that thousand fourteen hundred dollars a month for a coat closet is, uh, you know, this is this is real. Okay, let's let's make it happen. You know, I mean, no. once you're there and in it, you just have to focus. I mean, I, I would say this. When I before I came out, this goes back to a previous question, but before I came out, I did two things. One, I evaluated who of my good friends or just people mm. live where, right? Because a lot of what it is is who you know, right? Right, and um, as for him, it was Jason. For me, it's Dave Richards. And so, Jay, Dave, you know, and I came out. I, I drove out, and that was the other part. Is like, go check out the scene that you want to. You're thinking about living. Go out for two weeks. Call some friends up. Be like, hey, can I crash with you? Drive out, live in it. Go do see some rehearsals. Go see some live music. Meet people. Do the whole meet and greet thing. Because you're going to get a better, like, temperature on the scene that way than just right. off of, oh, yeah, man, it's great. <laughs> right. Cool, you know. <laughs> great for you. Is it going to be great for me? All right. Um, I, the other part of the decision for me was, Dave told me, he was like, you know, man, there's a real shortage of good lead players out here, good young lead players. He said, there's a bunch of, bunch of lead players. But the young lead players, the up, the next generation, yeah, up, right? There aren't that many, you know. He rambled off maybe yeah. four or five, and I was like, "Shit, really?" In all of LA, there's only four or five cats that are on that tier. And since then, a lot of them have left. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I mean, and since then, also, there's been a lot of younger kids that have set, you know, stepped right. up. So I mean, it was a situation where you make the choice based off of okay my probability of getting gigs or rehearsals is going to be higher because there's less lead players. No. My, you know, probably I like it here because of this and this. So when it came down to my first week in town, I was just like, okay, I have the opportunity. The only way that this is not going to happen is if I fuck it up. Yeah. You know, and just, you put your head down and you hustle, you take everything free, you have to pay to play, whatever it is, you take everything. Um, and you just get out there and start being heard by right. people. And then from that point, you you realize, okay, well, you know, I, like Dave would get me on some rehearsal bands, you know, just some stuff. You throw my name in, oh, hey, you need a lead player? Hey, my buddy's in town, he's available. Yeah. And I'd go do the, I'd go do the rehearsal. And I, next thing you know, I'm now a member of that band and I'm playing, you know, one rehearsal a week and I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And yeah. it just kind of, like he said, it starts to snowball eventually. Um, you just have to kind of really just jump in feet first and just go. Yeah. Don't, it, it's like when, when you make the decision to move, it's not a, a decision that makes sense necessarily. Yeah. yeah. You're yeah. really rolling the dice. I mean, you're, you're sitting there going, I hate to use all these gambling terms. We're in Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're just shooting the dice. Um, no, but it's, you're really sitting there going like, okay, I'm taking what is comfortable. Mm. I can sit here and live and pay my yeah. bills on my cover band gig in Dallas. Or I could go try and make something with my career. Yeah. And luckily at the time, you know, the wife, my wife, my ex-wife, yeah. she was super supportive of it. Yeah. And we were on the same page. That's great. And we, we made the decision together and we went. You know, right. we both wanted to move out to the West Coast. We came out and, and I started to do my thing, you know. Right. So, I mean, really, that's what it comes down to. Sometimes you just have to do it and not figure out, not worry about how it's going to happen or how it's going to work out, but just do it and make it work out. Right. Well, you know? and I, I'm just going to tell everybody there, I mean, the guy's, if I can, uh, can I have you for at least 15 more minutes? Is that cool? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mike, hey, man, when I see you, 
first nine rounds are on me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> I was like, I, I don't how long anything. is a phoenix drive from here <laughs> it's only four hours so um so anyway but um le, le, guys let me let me paint you a picture for those of you on the other side of the coin at the time i met andy i was a i'm i'm still a contractor for this major act we had a big gig in las vegas and i have friends in las vegas that are trumpet players and i talked to and uh when this when this when deciding who to hire, I talked to uh, Andy Rich or Eddie Rich, you know, and it was between my friend who I went to high school with and and um, Andy and and some other people. And here's the thing. The the sax player was like, look, I'm going to just be upset. Andy has the better reputation. And I, that to me, I was like. I mean, because I, I, I have this show that can't, you know, I can't have anything go wrong with it. It was a big show. And there's like, Andy has a better reputation. Andy's the guy that if you were going to put your life in your hands, that's the guy you hire. And I'm glad I did. And again, I'm talking about from a contractor, <laughs> from a contractor's point of view, where I had, a, I already had somebody I knew in Vegas. So guys, talk. let's talk about your reputations. Both of you, Andy, we'll start with you how you built them up and how you maintained them. Um, before I moved to, uh, I can't remember if it was, I think it was before I moved to Texas, actually. My, uh, again, I was talking to my dad, just getting, I was getting ready to leave, packing up the car. And my dad said, you know, just remember three things, show up, shut up and play, mm. show up on time, shut your mouth. Don't be a dick. Me, you know, yeah. and just play to the best of your ability. And that's, that's, gonna you know get you a great reputation if you just be on time don't be a dick and play your ass off you know yeah. do your homework you know it's so it's i mean really that's it's not it's not that hard to keep up a good reputation even i mean i've i've had a lot of gigs too where i've not had the best night for sure you yeah. know but you know as long as you keep those days to a minimum and yeah. and even if you're playing bad, you're not a, a pain in the ass to everybody else, you know. <laughs> it's it's just, you know, like you just gotta just gotta roll with it. And you know, if things go wrong on gigs, you know, you have to play an extra hour or something, you know, don't bitch about it. Just play, you know. It's it's worth keeping the the future gigs to just, you know, suck it up for the extra hour or whatever yeah. the case may right. be, you know. Reliability. So, rel yeah. yeah. Just be reliable. Yeah. Don't cause problems. <laughs> and same thing with with Mike on the other side of the coin. You know, I, I, everyone talks to Mike about your reputation. First of all, your reputation is you're a great cat. You're like he's the you know that's the first thing everybody says about you. Mike's a great guy. He's funny, man. I I would agree with that. That. And then the second one is like he's 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 so solid as a player. You can't go wrong. And then so forth and so on. Mike, how did you? develop your reputation was this the same as andy or did you do something a little different like you know my father my father was a lot of of my business upbringing kind of similar to andy he kind of gave me the same similar words of wisdom much more crass so i'll, I'll <laughs> leave that out but yeah. no but it, basically he just said look you're a good person you're good. You're a good person inside. Like who yeah. you are is a good person. So you don't have to worry about trying to prove yourself. Just show up and do the job. Just do the job to the best of your ability and you're going to be fine. And then what I add to that is when he said, keep your mouth shut, that's not just keep your mouth shut, you know, sitting on the stand. It's like, just go with the flow. If the gig runs over the gig runs over if you you know you get there and you're like i'm gonna play lead which by the way if you ever get into a new town don't ever expect to sit down on the lead book just don't like be willing to go wherever they first question out of your mouth should be where do you want me to sit yeah third is my favorite third is great you get paid the same <laughs> yeah. you get to play less money yeah. you get, get to play I Less notes. notes, you don't gotta blow. Like, yeah, it's great. Know, it's man. right in the middle. <laughs> but no, it does the thing. It's like that's a sign of respect to the lead player already on the gig. Right. You're just tipping your head, going, "Hey, man, 
Where do you want me? Yeah, yeah. I'm just here to help. Because a lot of people knew that I was a lead player when I moved to town. Yeah. Or not when I moved to town, but after moving to town. Right. First, you know, mm. if I'm playing with new cats, hey, man, where do you want me? And that's when everyone's like, oh, uh, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> All right, you, I'll sit on three. Sure, yeah, or two. Yeah, fine. Or the band leader comes up with, no, Mike, I want you on this. Whatever it is. But you just go with the flow. Don't yeah. make decisions. Don't come in making demands. Yeah. Right. It's never going to work out right. Right. I mean, as far I, as my reputation is concerned, man, it's just, I just try to be the best. God, I hate live my truest life, all that, you know, be the best yeah. with myself yes. as I can. I hate all those. Just don't, don't be a dick. That's really what yeah. it comes down to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, a- Andy, one thing that a lot of young players don't ex- learn the hard way is when you're on a high profile gig like Boys to Men or like Lady Go, whatever you're on. To- you're Boys to Men? You're a dick. <laughs> so anyway, when you're on that, when you're on a high profile gig like that, you know, or any high profile gig, both of you, you know, I've noticed the first thing they want to do is take selfies, do the whole groupie thing, and that is professional suicide. Oh yeah. So can you can you kind of talk to some of these younger players? I because I've seen I, I've been on corporate jobs where you know, like the celebrity comes out. And like the sax player will start taking selfies like right away. I'm yeah. like, dude, put your effing phone away. And yeah. so can you talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, I I mean, yeah, I really, I mean, I've worked with, with boys to men for five and a half years, six years now. And they, yeah. I don't think I have a picture with them at all. You know, nowhere on my phone, nothing, you know, but it's, but yeah, you can't just, just, <clears throat> the higher profile people, they don't, they all got people taking pictures of them all the time and everything. They don't, they don't need that shit when they're trying to work too, yeah. you know, yeah. you're, you're their backup. Yeah. Man. You're, you're, you're working man. for them. I mean, you don't do it. You're sitting in your cubicle. You don't take pictures of your boss when he walks in, you know, the CEO trying to, you know, whatever. Yeah. So it's, I don't just having your phone out on a bandstand in general is kind of a, I mean, it depends on the gig really, no. but I mean, most of the time, I try to keep my phone in my pocket. But yeah, yeah. I, I will say this to add on that, onto that: it's like there are times and places to get a picture. When you are when you step foot on stage, whether it's for rehearsal, sound check, you're on the job. Get off your phone. Focus at the job on hand, because if you're not focused on the job at hand, somebody else right behind you will be and they will hire them the next time it's, what, it, yeah. it, what, sorry it's like when i see somebody do that because i do a little bit of con- right. contracting i don't do as much as you but i do a yeah. little bit when, when i see somebody do that the immediate thing in my brain is like man that dude's young he's not yeah. there yet i can't call him yeah i just can't why because I, <clears throat> if i'm gonna put you on a gig with somebody who's you know higher up I don't want to. I don't want to see a picture from the stage while the person singing or, or sound check is. <laughs> yeah. I don't care. No one cares if pictures are on your social feed. Right. Like just play the gig. It's your job. I I see that a lot, guys, and I'm sure we both see that from our peers. And you're right. There is a time and place to take your little picture or whatever. That's One of the things. Just, that's really the yeah. Wait thing. till after the gig or you know whether yeah. you're just that you know. Wait for an appropriate time and ask. Yeah. Don't creepily yeah. take pictures of them from behind your stand, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm sure but all of us have seen that. And we, I think we would all agree that that cannot help your career. That does not help your reputation at all. In fact, it, it damages it. And, um, you know, the being a groupie on stage, I think that's what I call it, being a groupie on stage. You know, um, you know a lot of young people feel that, this is validation for how good of a musician they are. Oh okay. yeah. And um, let's just one more, one more, one more thing, guys. You guys are, again, I, I, I'm not. Yeah, I just give credit where it's credit. You guys are amazing trumpet players, amazing musicians. But one thing I've noticed is that some musicians, especially now with COVID, and some musicians 
judge their self-worth on how much money they make. Mm-hmm. And we all know the type. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Well, I made 50000 playing with so-and-so. You know, or I made... And, you know, the thing is that those people that are not making any money for the last eight, nine months, those are the people we are, we were talking about getting dark, you know, you know, let me, let's talk about the mindset that you have to have every week, every month, every day of your life. When you get up and you're like, this is what I want to do, even post COVID or pre COVID or during COVID, because things have changed. And, you know, I know a lot of us, some, some of us, who are amazing musicians have to get day jobs. Mike said that he got a day job. Yep. That has, no, and in my opinion, that's just Mike taking care of business. That does not reflect on. He's an amazing trumpet player, you know. And Bill so, have to be paid, man. Yeah, that's just what it comes down yeah. to. They don't pay themselves. Right. So let's talk about that, guys. If if you guys don't mind, the young people that are at school or actually out in the field right now that are looking at themselves, going, I have to work at Discount Tire. Or I have to do this, or I have to do that. Can you talk about you know breaking down that barrier that your self worth is not dependent on, or how good of a musician you are doesn't depend on how much money you make or how many gigs you have. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I was, I will not lie and say that I wasn't bummed out when I had to get a day job, right? Because everybody wants to play music for their career when they're a musician, right? No. Like I moved to LA to be a musician shit happens yeah. you know yeah. life happens right. and so you kind of like my options were leave la or get a job and survive survive long enough to where i could one day when everything opens back up enough to where i could play regularly yeah. i can get back into it and do right. it um my self-worth as a person is not based off of how much money I do because I try to keep myself humble. And that, I think that's really what it comes down to is humility will keep you level. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Be excited, be appreciative, be feel like you've accomplished something, have that, that, that like I'm proud of myself moment because I broke this mark, this mile marker for me because I made this much last year. Right. That's awesome setting goals is important but at the end of the day if that gig goes away i'm still the same human being and i'm still the same trumpet player that i've always been yeah gigs are just jobs you get fired from jobs you get released from jobs gigs are more so you just kind of have to understand that you're always shuffling the deck you're always an interchangeable piece there's another vegas euphemism again there we go yeah hey man (laughs) help it i'm uh (laughs) I'm stuck. Um, <laughs> no, it's it really that's what it comes down to. It's like yeah. I'm not saying don't get dark because I I mean I know why a lot of people get dark. It's it's a hard mental space to be in. Yeah. Right. We're tugging at our emotions and our mental. I mean, this is just a hard spot to be in. Not being able to do anything. Yeah. You know, it's difficult. It really is. It it is a tough spot. But you have to remember to yourself that I'm still me. Yeah. Nothing's changed. My situation's changed, but I haven't changed. You know? And so yeah, I haven't necessarily touched my horn as much as I would have. I mean, I think life has a way of doing that when you need to do things a different way, but I still I mean, I have a, a little recording session on Monday night when I get back to town. Yeah. You know, it's just like it's a little something. It's probably gonna pay me like, you know, a dollar fifty and some pizza. But you lucky duck. I know, man. Yeah, man. Just, for a buddy of mine. You get all the great gigs, Mike. You get all. The <laughs> you great. have a gig, man. Damn. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's my first gig in six months. <laughs> no, but it's like you just you just take what you can. Yeah. Keep yourself on reminding yourself, like, oh yeah, this is why I do it. Yeah. This is why I do this. You know, right. put yourself in the position to be successful with what you're doing. Right. Right now, I have the opportunity to be successful because I have a day job. Yeah. I'm able to stay in town and keep living. All right. What more can I ask for? You know? Right. And then moving back to Texas, you know? Yeah. I, that's for sure. That's a, 
<laughs> well, I'm guys, I'm not talking about. It. Uh, guys, here's the thing. I've taken up way too much of your time, but I'm going to ask this one question from you. This one question. This is my question. That I'll ask it to Andy, and then I'll ask it to, to Mike. <clears throat> uh, you know, Andy, being a you would say being a musician, you have to be a special kind of person. You know, you have to have a thick skin. Blah blah blah. We talked about all those things. Let me ask you, Andy. So if if you were to sit down with you twenty years or say ten years ago, the year, what would you say to yourself as far as your career? What would you tell yourself? I would say uh, definitely. You can always work harder. Mm-hmm. You can yeah. always work harder. Yeah. Because um, 10 years ago, I felt like that was when I first started practicing very consistently and like trying to to practice every day a lot, you know, and, and really trying to get better. That was right when I got to North Texas and was, yeah. you know, surrounded by, you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah. but yeah, it just, just get in there and put in the work and, and it, it will pay off eventually. Cause I, I never thought I'd be here, especially this early on in life, you know, but it happened and I definitely could have worked hard. If I would have worked harder, who knows where I'd be now, you know? Uh, yeah. It could have happened quicker. And a degree. Ah, I would have only had to know Mike for like five years instead of seven. It was, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah see, Okay. Uh, so uh, no, just yeah, you, you can always work harder. Yeah. You know? I mean that's that's truth. I mean I think that's kind of the, the common thread with all, especially trumpet players. Let's be real. We're a certain breed of human being that most of us don't really do put the time in that we need to. Right. We we maintain really easily. We can maintain, but then that extra hour into two hours of practice time where you're like man i should really work on my triple tone man i should really work on on things that are not high notes i should work on my deficiencies yeah. you know i mean that is the that is the crooks i mean practice is uh, <laughs> that's the the great equalizer man it's like yeah. i've seen in the last nine months of this <coughs> pandemic seven months of a pandemic i've seen some of my friends who are already amazing players yeah who i would say at the time i was on the on a similar level with right and they have just taken the time practiced hours every day yeah and just they're on a whole different a whole different thing yeah you know, they're just they're getting their jazz together they're getting their classical together their their chops they have more range they get this it's like next thing you know they're becoming more of a complete player because you can't work in any scene in just one aspect. You just won't. You right. Won't right. Right. I, I'll say this too. You know, the two gentlemen you guys see in front of you here are not one dimensional players. They're multi-dimensional players. It doesn't matter what you put in front of them. Uh, you know, they're gonna they're gonna do the job. And I think that's why you guys are so successful at what you're doing now, is because you understood that right away. And you didn't just practice high notes, you know. Uh, Andy, you're like you said, you're a classical major. And you're like, well, I got to play jazz. You know, I got to do this. So, <clears throat> uh, guys. Yeah, there's a lot of fake in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, you know, I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your Sunday to join me and help, and talk with me here. Um, guys, uh, on a closing note, I just want to say, if you ever get a chance, um, you can see Michael Campagna at the Union in, uh, in Burbank, California. When it opens up. When it opens up. Yeah, uh, he's playing with the uh, uh, the Barone Big Band. And who else, Mike? Ron King's Big Band. I'm, Ron I'm King's Big Band. With, uh, play with, I sub with a lot of different bands out there. Yeah. You know, I'm just, I just try to immerse myself in the scene and be available for everything. Yeah. And if you're ever in Las Vegas, uh, you can hear Andy at the Boys to Men show. And uh, he's around. And, uh, again, both are amazing players. And you guys need to do an album together. All right. Done. I ain't doing anything. Let's do it. <laughs> what else are we going to do with our time? Do you want us to practice first, though? Probably, yeah. 
Yeah, Pick up the horn cold. Should probably warm up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> hey guys, I want to thank everybody who joined us today and uh, on online. And uh, if you have any questions, you can just leave them there in the comments. Mike is both these guys are great guys. And if you have any questions for them, they'd be more than happy to answer. Uh, guys, have a great Sunday. Thank you so much for joining me, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks for having us, John. All right, take care, guys. Later, See ya. All right.